Well, I, we all know why we're here. It's to mark the publication of Pat's book and to discuss with Pat what this book is about. Uh, he'd already written one book and at some point he decided to write an autobiography, which I think if you read it, you'll find you'd be grateful for him to having done it. It's a, it's, it's a, it's a book kind of of three parts. It takes, it's an autobiographical book. It starts with his childhood in Eng growing up and you know, being born in Belfast, growing up in England, coming back, um, entering the armed struggle, um, what that was like, what led, it, led him to internment and eventually you know, to the bomb in Brighton and the, uh, and the long sentence that he had there and he recounts his prison experience. Uh, and then finally this, I imagine unexpected by him, extraordinary event of being contacted by two people who were directly or indirectly victims of that bomb and you know the 20 years he spent with the uh, daughter of the Tory MP who was killed in the blast and what he learned from that. And it's, um, uh, like Lena said, it's a very important book. It's, it's a story not told enough. It makes, you're with him every step of the way it, with his decision making. It's a very intelligent, very well written, very incisive book. He doesn't spare himself. His flaws are, he's not, he's unafraid of that. Well, I don't know, he's, at least he, he reveals them. He kind of looks at himself as if he were another person, but he has access to that person's inner life, you know, and it's, it's so it has this kind of relentless scrutinizing objectivity about it. And he's not fixed in his responses, you know, he changes, he, he's open to change. So it's a book that's in movement, you know, it's, it, it's a person in movement. Um, and uh, it's valuable for that, but it's all, you know, just of a record of somebody who was a volunteer and what they went through and why they did it. Uh, you know, he's a very, he thinks very coherently and he's very, it's, it's very open thinking. So anyway, I imagine you'll all want to read it and you'll get it and you don't need, need to spoil it by saying any more about it. But um, so what we're gonna do is just, I'm gonna ask him some questions and then he might read a little bit uh, in response to those questions. And then um, if any of you wanna ask any questions, you'd be welcome to do so. So I'm just gonna kind of follow the track of the book um, and say to Pat, you know, you were, you were born in Belfast, but uh, grew up in England and came back to Belfast and you were brought, you. you you moved into the armed struggle. I just want to know what, like, how did that happen? What were, what were the steps you took? And can you say something about that? Well, one of the reasons I read the book where uh, Grieving Begins was to uh, answer those questions for myself. I've often wondered, you know, the uh, turns of my life, how I ended up in that struggle. After, as you said, formative years been brought up in England, not a natural regression, you know, to join the IRA after that background. But it seemed at the time the most logical thing in the world to join that struggle. So the book examines that and how I came to that decision. Mm -hmm. And uh, I returned uh, to Belfast in um, 71, just after internment. It was, it was the reportage of internment in the British press media that brought me back here. Always felt very close. I have uh, relatives who just skip a generation, great uncles and grandfathers who had been in turn. And uh, I, I felt very close to this place. Uh, in a way, I could never be close to England being brought up there. Uh, I always felt marginalized, not belonging there, out of step. And knowing that what was happening in the streets and knowing that you couldn't trust what we were reading in the papers, I wanted to see for myself. I didn't come uh, back here with any real fixed views about armed struggle, but I knew there were injustices that uh, people were trying to address. And it was just to see for myself, to get some sense of it. And that uh, 
I, I should also add that it's a, it's a, one of the curiosities of my life. At one point, I would have, uh, I would have described myself as a, as a pacifist. Uh, without giving it too much thought or totally understanding all the meanings in that word, I would have been anti-war. And at that time, you're talking about the 60s. If you're a young person, you were, you were keen to, uh, about what was happening in the world, what was happening in, in Cuba, uh, what was happening in Vietnam. See, you know, this is the beginning of your political awareness. But then suddenly it's, uh, it's happening on your doorstep in a place that you identify with and care about and, uh, you know, uh, the people you love. So I wanted to be here and part of that. Hmm. And you describe a, a youth that is um, not entirely errant, but nevertheless had its um, lack of direction at some points, uh, some encounters with drugs, some petty crime. I mean, you're very open about that in, in the book. Mm -hmm. And uh, then you join the movement. And uh, can you say what effect being in the IRA did for you intellectually, ethically, mm -hmm. psychically? It wasn't like a, a, a leap from this kind of like, you know, the, the drug addiction and drink and all of that into the IRA. There was a, there was, there was a gap there, a learning curve, if you like. Mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, that was all part of my uh, learning life experience and I brought that to it as well, you know. <laughs> I, I mean, it's really embarrassing to, to, to say this. When I came back to Belfast, I thought I'd seen it all. I thought I'd been around a few corners, you know, and there was nothing, nothing that's happened the last four, the 40 years. I could have been prepared for. Yeah, so, so it did change. It did change. And it was seeing what was happening in our districts. I think I was always a, an individual. Didn't really think much about community and things like that. And then you belong to a community and you get to know what that means. Mm. And you're seeing how people pull so little to have, you know, together in struggle. And uh, I mean, it's, uh, I wanted to be part of that. I wanted to make a contribution to it, you know. And, um, I should say something about the uh, area uh, I first got involved with, which was the old Carry Kill, we knew it as Unity Flats. And it was a real battleground and it was uh, under siege. You know, it's there, the small nationalist Catholic uh, enclave at the bottom of, you know, entrance there to the gateway to Protestant West Belfast. And so there'd be constant skirmishes there, you know, at weekends in particular. I can, I can remember going out and dealing with some of them. You'd be required to calm things down in the area and you were getting hit by boats from uh, shipyard workers and you were getting fired at by the Brits, plastic bullets. I remember, I, hit, I remember getting hit by a plastic bullet and a rivet in the same incident, you know, trying to just uh, curb things in the area. So it was a real battleground, that area. Only 300 residences, you know, various flats, small area, I've seen uh, real hard times, a real history of struggle there, going back to the 20s and people who remembered those, remembered, you know, uh, you know, the, the pogroms in Belfast. It was a living memory. And, you know, uh, we, we talk later of a, like a culture of resistance that stems from the lived experience of people and passing that on. And it was happening to a new generation. Mm. And uh, I was there to uh, absorb it and want to be a part of it. And the focusing of the mind, I mean, to, to, uh, to be focused on objectives yeah. and, and, and also yeah. what happened yeah. to you in Long Cash in terms of, you know, yeah. political education and things like that. How, how did that affect you? I would you? say, well, there was a big contrast. There was a time when I couldn't focus. I write in the book about this. I think of, uh, today you, I, I might have, uh, there might have been, uh, Diagnosed with some form of attention deficits at school. Mm. Couldn't focus. I was the kid who was messing about all the time. But uh, during the course of the struggle, I learned to focus, you know, um, particularly in jail. But see, when you're on the, uh, on the streets, you had to focus, mm. you know, and you found you could. Mm. You know, uh, uh, that wasn't a decision that you made. That's something you had to find in that split second. Mm. You know. And what about the experience in Long Cash? What, what did that do to you? Well, I was two and a half uh, years interned, two years, five months interned. And uh, well, I, again, I learned that uh, 
And I had no experience of this prior uh, to internment, no uh, of, of, of real thirst for knowledge and wanting to know what the struggle was about, how we got here, specifically in these cages. Wanted to know that. You, I mean, you, you had a broad view of it, but there were so many unanswered questions. And, uh, and not everybody had the answer then either. You know, it was a, another huge uh, learning curve. But you know, um, you're, you're in jail with a lot of very clever people and experienced people who did have a, a real grasp of politics and of history. And I benefited from that. And also books, I mean, the place was coming down with books. And uh, I did a lot of reading, you know, uh, during internment. And throughout uh, any period I was incarcerated. And were there a lot of classes going on or lectures going on or um, discussion groups going on? Well, it became in two forms. Uh, there was what we organized ourselves, you know, from our kind of pool of resources of understanding of subjects. There would have also been a, an element of formal education that some of the guys uh, got involved in. And then at one point, there were outside uh, academics coming in uh, into some program run with Queens, I believe. And so, yes, we, I mean, uh, some brilliant stuff. Mm. And again, books, you know, uh, like a first read Connolly in the cash. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and your involvement out in the street, I mean, it was, a, it was a very long war. You entered it at the beginning and you, you know, you observed it, you know, until the Good Friday Agreement mm. and it went through many phases. Uh, mm -hmm. Looking back at it now, what is your assessment of the, of the, of the war itself? I think the, the first thing absolutely needs to be borne in mind is how long it went on. And it went through all sorts of different phases of struggle. And you know, you know the, the, the struggle that we were fighting in the early days in, in the 72, 76 period, 77 period, it's completely different from the struggle. We just got better at it, to be perfectly honest. We had to, we had to get better at it. Um, but we also got to recognize that, you know, uh, what we didn't have, and, you know, uh, and that was um, the means to really put political pressure on our enemies to get them around the table. The, the armed struggle on its own couldn't achieve that. Uh, it, it allowed for the development of Sinn Féin, et cetera. But if you, uh, Throughout that struggle, there was initiatives by the, the British, you know, the, uh, to, uh, as they said, to foist a solution on us. Every single initiative they were ever involved in had at its core the desire to defeat us. Mm. Simple as that. And we would have been defeated if we hadn't developed politically, you know, and that happened with the backdrop of the war. And that's right. I think, I think that's remarkable, you know. Mm. I mean, you. You, you wondered if the politicians had been willing to, you know, you know take on board their responsibility, and particularly talking about the, you know, the British politicians. That conflict would have been over decades before. Mm. Mm. And then you were, after Brighton, you were arrested, and you spent all those years, 15 years in jail, 14? 14. 14. 14 years in jail. Um, and, you know, there had been a big struggle in, the prisons in Ireland, but it must have been very different to be in prison in England. Can you can you say something about what it was like to be in, you know, far away from you know the jailed comrades that you'd had, and and you were stuck in England? Can you say what that felt like? Well, we were small in number, and we were dispersed around uh, all the British prison system. I think it was about one hundred and forty odd jails at that time in that system. Uh, I, I was spurred largely what we call normal location. That is, I didn't uh, spend time in mixing with, you know, the, the, the whole range of prisoners. I was kept for most of the time in England in special secure units where there would have been um, a small group of men held together, seven say would have been typical for years and with their own contingent of uh, security, you know, and that would be changed every six months. Literally, you're talking about prisons within prisons. Mm. I think where the, the people who really suffered from that was our families who, uh, you know, um, struggled uh, to visit. 
there's a couple of men here I was in jail with in England, you know, with, with tough times, but particularly tough for our families mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. of the, you know, the distances involved yeah. in mm -hmm. maintaining relationships. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And throughout the whole period, was it, was it difficult to maintain your morale and your, you know, your motivation when there's so much vilification going on of the movement outside, including in this island, you know, much of it, you know, coming from the broadcasting organizations of, of, of the Free State and so on. So, I mean, it, do, is there some sense in which you internalize this vilification? Does, it, does that, something like that happen? You're always, your back, your back was against the wall um, because we were vilified. Mm. And uh, we, there was absolutely no recognition of what our struggle was about. From anybody in authority, prison, prison governors, prisoners, other uh, prison wardens, hadn't a clue, you know. And even uh, those, and there was a, uh, quite a few uh, ex squaddies would have joined the prison service and really hadn't a clue about us and believed the stories, I think. And so, you'd, I, don't, I, I don't think we internalized that. I think that we just had to deal with it, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, I was always felt, I'd like to say this. I never, for, there was never an instant at any time uh, I was involved in that struggle where I thought we were going to be defeated. Mm -hmm. no, and there were times when we perhaps, you could be argued we came near to it, mm -hmm. but there was always something within the movement that uh, recognized where we were at fault and needed to develop. Mm -hmm. And uh, that, that was the nature of the struggle. And uh, the media uh, you know, bombardment, you know, pulpit and lectern, you know, we had to deal with that. Our, our communities knew what we were at. You know, um, again, uh, there'll be people watching this will not appreciate this point. They'll have this idea of the Republican movement of the IRA as somehow uh, a group external to the communities. You know, we've been called parasites and all, you know, all the, you know, all the vile abuse that we've received. As far as I was concerned, the IRA was a community. Mm -hmm. um, the struggle I was involved in was in the IRA, but that struggle couldn't be couldn't have been carried forth if it hadn't have been for the constant backup support of our communities. Mm -hmm. Did you meet any understanding from English prisoners you met in English jails? As I said, I didn't meet many mm -hmm. uh, English prisoners. There was one time I was on um, uh, a lockdown. I, mean, I, I do talk about this, but it skips my mind now what that was all about. But I, I would have been uh, six weeks in the lockdown. And I remember um, coming down to the exercise yard in the first morning there, and I was wondering what reception was going to be like. Walking around, other guys come down singly, the letter to the cells, they're coming down singly, walking around. It was only in about the last five minutes of our exercise period that this big Scouse guy came over and uh, so who are you, mate? You know, no animosity. Um, I explain I'm a Republican prisoner. And he immediately, you know, says, welcome here. And everybody else in the, the quadrant would have come over and shook hands and mm -hmm. said hello. Mm -hmm. And they, they revealed to me that when they were being uh, unlocked, they were given a nudge in the wing, there's an IRA man down there in the yard, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. But even then, they, they kept their distance. Mm -hmm. As I said, a big, big guy came across and introduced himself. Mm -hmm. And if you, if you say you thought you could, that the IRA could never be defeated, did you think it could win? Did you think it could bring, could it, could it bring a victory on its own? You see, in the, in the, at the beginning, we didn't think about victory other than as just, you know, fighting the Brits. Mm -hmm. uh, quite honestly, that's how politically unaware I was. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and, but, you know, you, you learn as in the course of that struggle, you know, what was required and, what you, where your weaknesses lie, you know. And uh, I, I mentioned this in the book, I think it was identified at an early stage that where we were weakest, which was politically, was where we had to be strongest. Mm -hmm. That's where the development work needed to be done. Mm -hmm. It took us a long time against a backdrop of people trying to thwart us from that development politically. Yeah. Um, and what, I mean, you, you would have been in discussions about why to bring the war to England and, and the value that might have had to the struggle. Can you say a bit about the, you know, how, how you...
project. I've never been out of Belfast. Mm. So it's there was an onus because I had that background and maybe this is a, where um, you know uh, I could best contribute. Mm. So the bomb happens in Brighton and you're arrested and tried and convicted and uh, you served those long years, which we've already spoken about a bit. Uh, how, how did it happen that you came into contact with these two people that were adversely affected okay. by, yeah. by that operation? Yeah. Well, it was uh, the peace process was in train. A big part of that was the early release of the political prisoners. I was marked down to get out, I think, uh, in uh, 2000 at this stage. In fact, I got out in 99. But in 98, I got a letter, and it was from a guy called uh, Harvey Thomas. And he had been injured in the, in the, um, in the bomb. In fact, uh, he, uh, he, he wrote about it in a book, he sent me a copy of the book. And he was a, he was a Christian, and from a, a deep Christian uh, position, belief. He felt he had to forgive me, you know, uh, and that was the cause of the letter. He sent me the letter. And, I, you know, I, I read it and I read it inside out and I responded to it, you know. And I, I even uh, requested a meeting with me. He wanted to visit the prison. I consulted. I didn't feel then that was a decision I could make. Um, uh, just in case there was a, uh, how would you put it, uh, um, other things that might affect. And at this stage, there was a, the, the early release of the prisoners was coming under a lot of flag. And it was felt that any negative publicity to me meeting Harvey Thomas might have undermined the release program. So it was decided not to meet him then. But I had a, a firm uh, idea in my head that at some future point when released, I would meet him. Mm -hmm. uh, but before that happened, I heard, and I was out by jail at this time, I heard that somebody connected with Brighton who'd lost a father. You know, there's five people killed in, in Brighton. A woman whose father was killed uh, talked, who had been meeting Republicans for years, if you say, had been coming over since a very early stage, I think from quite shortly after the bomb. I think she was visiting Belfast in 86. So we're, this is remarkable. Uh, we're trying to understand the situation, you know? open to uh, reading us, understanding us. She wanted to meet me. Um, uh, the only thing was on my mind, would this be, was this liable to be, you know, confrontational? Mm -hmm. uh, which I think would have solved no, obviously, uh, no purpose. But the people who she had met all uh, were of the opinion that she'd know. She really wants to understand. She wants to be able to put her father's death in a context and she's very open. And so I, I, to be honest, I readily enough agreed. And then you're on, you're on the threshold of meeting this person. And I think, then I, th I think, oh, I was assailed with doubts in that moment, assailed with doubts in that moment. And uh, uh, honestly, I couldn't put, put a strong a sentence together. Uh, we were in a room, there's other people around who would have been supportive of what we were going to do. But I think we both recognized that we needed to sit and talk privately, and we did. It was facilitated. We talked for some three hours. And uh, I haven't met that woman now. Her name's Joe Barry. Uh, her father was Sir Anthony Barry. He was the only actual politician who was killed in, in the bomb. We've been meeting 20 years now. I've lost track of how many times I've sat and talked. Mm. We've sat and talked in all sorts of different venues. Um, like this, groups like this, mm -hmm. um, um, universities, schools, prisons, mm -hmm. went into prisons and talk, conferences, a lot of work abroad as well, small groups, large groups, over 200 times easily, just give up counting at some point. What's remarkable about that is that we continue to meet. Uh, this, despite the fact that I killed her father, she's prepared continue the dialogue and hasn't even reached any conclusions. It's not as if we've arrived at some space where everything's back because it can't. Because no matter you know, what you can achieve as two human beings discussing uh, tragic uh, history, you know, can't undo the loss. But we were hoping, we both hope, I think I, I, think I can't speak uh, for Joe here, 
that as an example, it can be an example that it's possible. Uh, terrible things have happened, despite it, it's possible to establish a contact and to build trust. And uh, the fervent hope is that that will act as an example for others. It will encourage others to do the same. No, I'm never going to, um, or would try to convince uh, Joe Barry or other victims about it. I would just hope that we begin to see some of the pressures we under. Mm -hmm. Just begin to you achieve that through contact and dialogue. You know, that's the lesson, contact and dialogue. It's the two basic missing ingredients in this struggle that more resources should be pumped in to try and to, you know, achieve. And I wonder now where we would be if those resources had been adequately directed towards that purpose. You know, I think we'd be further along because there's massive distrust out there that can only begin to be challenged through, and I repeat, you know, contact and dialogue. Mm. That was the lesson. You mentioned uh, the Christian man, uh, Harvey Tomlin, Harvey Thomas, Thomas, Thomas uh, that, that, that he, he wanted to meet you to forgive you. So yes. you probably he, he had- me in the, in the letter and he was doing that from a, uh, yeah. a, a Christian perspective. Yeah, and you must have had to do a fair amount of thinking about what he meant by forgiveness. I mean, does it, was, it assume a culpability on your part? Are you being forgiven for something you did wrong? Are you, are you being forgiven for somehow causing hurt to him that may or may not be a legitimate action on your part? I mean, you must have had to contemplate what forgiveness means. Yeah, yeah. of course. Hmm. Well, more than that, I try, to, I, I try to get some sort of a grip on it. I mean, I remember getting literature on the subject. The one uh, book in particular was a compendium of definitions, and it was about 30 or more pages of these definitions. And you wade through that and you know you're not learning much believe me it's mm. contradictory etc most people think of forgiveness in this christian way you know to forgive you have to repent there's no acknowledgement that you can feel um regret about actions that's different from seeking forgiveness that's seeking forgiveness so you're coming to these meetings from, from different perspectives mm. uh, and you're hoping that through just discussing that you can arrive at some commonality of thought on it but there, there, there's huge uh, gaps there. Uh, and uh, Harvey could never for a second countenance, uh, you know, my actions, he couldn't. It was, it was important for him though, as a Christian to forgive, mm -hmm. to offer forgiveness. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And he's never tried to change me in that regard. I, it's, this is incredible. I'm, I'm not too sure I'm breaking confidence here. I've met that man on a good few occasions. He's brought me into his house, introduced me to his family, I was even at the recently. I was as a I was a attending a family event mm -hmm. in in England. Mm -hmm. So I find that remarkable. So mm -hmm. These things are possible. I got the impression from reading your book that um, Joe Barry went a, a very long way in trying to, as you say, she was trying to understand not only you but and the bomb, but the, the the struggle in general to try to get some sense of context to what had happened. But it would, it's, it's a step that is very difficult for her to make to, she, 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 there's, there seemed to be some insistence that you renounce the act. And can she get beyond that? Can, is it? No, she, in, in fact, I'm, I'm sure she would wish that, but she's never expressed that. Mm -hmm. And in fact, she's demonstrated um, remarkable insight into our struggle. She understands it. She's no stranger here. She gets it. Uh, she couldn't ever agree with it. She, she, she is a pacifist in a real sense. And uh, yeah, and very spiritual woman, actually, really deeply spiritual woman. Mm. And, and so I wouldn't expect her to, to, uh, to understand at that level. She could never cross that line. Mm -hmm. She couldn't mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. as a pacifist. Mm -hmm. And yet, as I said, 20 years and we're still meeting. Yes, yes. Where did the, t the title of this book is Where Grieving Begins? Can you, can you tell me where you got that title, or where, where that came from? It, um, it came from a Pablo Neruda poem. Mm. And uh, it was a very, uh, 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 I've got a bit of it written out here in anticipation of that question. The, uh, the poem was called Adioses. And uh, well, I'll, I'll read it. That's only, a, it's only the one verse out of it. The traveler asks himself, if he lived out a lifetime, 
pushing the distance away? Does he come back to the place where his grieving began? Squander his dose of identity again? Say his goodbyes again and go? Well, I mean, I was knocked out by that. Uh, it's so suggestive of some of the journeys we were on, you know, mm. and trying to understand that. So, like, I just took the title. Mm -hmm, to mm. begin. Um, and it also seemed to... I've got this idea in writing the book that we can't really grieve properly until we're, we have questions answered, etc. that we deal with the past and its legacy, you know, and we've all carry a lot of weight from that past. And until people have answers and, you know, their satisfaction, I think it's, I think we can't say we can't grieve properly mm -hmm. as communities, mm -hmm. as individuals. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm, that's suggested in the book as well. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, this, this episode in your life, this encounter with Harvey Thomas and her, it, it, it kind of brings you into some kind of essence of what war is. I mean, the taking of life and then you're brought face to face with somebody who is effect, affected by that, is, is living with the consequences of your actions. And it's, um, that's very rare for soldiers, I would imagine, to come so face to face with, with that. And I wonder, you know, what does it do for you? I mean, you know, she needed to do yeah, it. Yeah. What does it do for you? Yeah, yeah. Well, I remember um, a meeting I had, uh, it was a kind of an, a fringe of the fella a few years back with uh, veterans for peace, groups of ex-bodies who did want to explore that past and were willing to listen to Republicans, et cetera. We're here on a visit, they all came back, all the regiments, you can imagine the powers and Marines were there. And they're coming back as squaddies who, you know, were troubled about that past, you know. Uh, that tells me that it's not unique. Mm -hmm. And most Republicans I know can share that. And I think would rather enough identify and realize that uh, some of the people we were in conflict with would have their own, you know, need to examine the, mm -hmm. the past and look over matters, mm -hmm. you know. And uh, I learned a lot from those encounters, you know. We talk about where grieving begins. There's a lot of pain we all carry from that. And as part of you can close down in conflict. I didn't even begin to realize that fully until I met Joe Barry. And it was the course of talking over. You know, because you, you think, of, well, we, we, I'm prepared to meet victims. You know, I'm prepared. I, I'm, I'm hungry for that knowledge. Meet them. But until you're actually in the room of a victim, you know, uh, that, that opens a dimension up. It's quite risky, I would imagine. It's, it can be extremely risky and has mm. to be facilitated really with a lot of thought beforehand. Mm. But, but, but in, in meeting Joe, as I said, like I, we're used to, as you said, to refer back to an earlier question, we're used to being victimized and demonized. We're used to that. And uh, to the point where, you know, we, we decided we can't do that with others. And you, you, which makes you believe that you're more open than others, you know, you're taking that stand. You're going into meetings, you're prepared to listen. But until you actually do listen to the poem, to the, to the pain, mm. you, you really don't know what you're dealing with. Mm -hmm. You really do not. Mm -hmm. And uh, as I'm saying, I, I, began to, I began to realize from listening to Joe's story, you know, that something I would have readily attributed to our enemies I was responsible for it too. And that is, I was capable up to a point of demonization. I wasn't saying who we were fighting with in the you know, fullness of their humanity. And you can argue that's um, necessary in conflict. How could you do the things we had to do if we knew the people intimately? How could we do that? Mm. I don't think we could. I honestly don't think, I don't think I could. And most of the Republicans I know, I think that applies to as well. So that, was a, that started a, a uh, a big a lesson for me, you know. And uh, as I said, um, Joe, I remember that first meeting, Joe was talking about her, her father, revealing things, asking good questions and coming across as this really sound person, sound human being. And, you know, I just at some point, I, I, I just clicked, something clicked with me. The, the, the value, the goodness I could see in this woman must have at some level come from her father and mm -hmm. I killed him mm -hmm. uh, you know uh, I killed him 
fine human being. No matter, no matter his politics, his leanings, doesn't matter. He had somehow, you know, been responsible for the, you know, the, you know, the goodness I've seen in this woman. And uh, that's, a, that's a big lesson to learn. What does and it feel like? Nothing I mean, had, does, is it painful? Nothing had, well, it was something everybody might imagine that uh, because I've uh, been on this 20 year dialogue with this woman that it was easier and it isn't. It's never easy for either of us. And sometimes we've had to force ourselves to meet, you know, and, you know, and usually it's in uh, situations in public, you know, uh, and we rally and we've fallen out. And there's been times when we just couldn't go on with it. Uh, back out, then uh, somewhere down the line, we'll get an invitation to speak and you, there's that idea in your head, I have to continue this, you know, mm. can't give up on this, We've come this far. I guess there's a, there's a paradox involved in any war that um, some people who are participating in it, uh, soldiers, whether they're uniformed or whether they're insurgents or whatever they may be, uh, possess varying degrees of belief about what they're doing, what their yeah. objectives are, what they're willing yeah. to do to reach that objectives. And at the same time, some of them, depending on their sensitivities, might have a feeling of sorrow, uh, even if they believe absolutely in the legitimacy yeah. of, the, of, of, the, of the war, of their part in yeah. the war, and they would feel sorrow at the consequences. And, yeah. and, and you know, I think generally society seem to allow soldiers to, to be in this, the society tolerates this paradox and they extend this understanding to soldiers. But my impression is that, you know, if you say that about it, an IRA volunteer, they just think, oh, that's hypocritical, you know? And, you know, do, do you, you know, it doesn't seem the same understanding is extended. Uh, that would be my uh, understanding of the volunteers I knew. Um, mm. I, I see many of them who um, have carry a lot of pain, carry a lot of pain about the past. And I'm just saying this is the society's understanding. It, yes, but I, I would describe it as a conflict, you know, an internal conflict. I feel conflicted about the fact that, you know, uh, people were hurt from my actions, actions of the movement, but my actions. Mm. Um, and yet I can stand over those actions and know they were necessary. So there's the conflict, mm. you know, you can stand over your, your, your actions of the movement, know they're necessary, and you can carry the burden of being caused. Mm. Well, and the fact that you expose yourself to this perhaps no, no, yeah. puts a, an un, unusually, maybe an unusual burden on you. Yeah, and yet I feel the value in doing it. Mm -hmm. The sense of value in doing it. And uh, I'm, for Joe, and for other victims, but for myself. It's, something that, it's like a, a, a circle, uh, I can't swear. I don't know how to, I don't know whether it's even possible to. And uh, yet I've been driven to try. Can I read something? Sure. Because I, I, yeah, I, yeah, I, we were I, talking about that. I, um, I do uh, deal with this if I can find this spot. Uh, Yeah, okay. I'll start off with a wee bit of context. It's not too long, but if you don't mind me reading until I get to the point. Britain partitioned Ireland through violence, political chicanery, and the threat of a further escalation of repression. From one perspective, a unionist perspective, partition drew a line under the past. It was intended to establish its own historical calendar with 1921 as year zero. Northern nationalists found themselves locked into a Protestant state for a Protestant people. The grandparents and parents of my generation found themselves bereft of the means to address their grievances. All means had been tried, all had failed. Marches, demonstrations, rallies, campaigning, lobbying, electoral politics within a gerrymandered constituency framework. The full range of open, democratic, constitutional means of tackling injustice. They had to endure repression and poverty in every decade. Eventually, the pot boiled over. In conflict, any conflict, we are all diminished. Outcomes are rarely definitive. 
we can survive, perhaps achieve some ends, more equality, liberty, justice, but often loss and pain at the personal level preclude any sense of victory. For some, nothing is worth the loss of a single drop of blood. Others may take stock of future benefits, the ends justifying the means. To have prevailed against terrible odds seems a victory. If our enemies had indeed won, as we often hear promulgated in their media, we might have expected from them more magnanimity, a willingness to move on, instead of which there is a continual assertion of our defeat. I am satisfied that we prevailed, but at terrible cost. When the Dalai Lama was asked why he didn't fight the Chinese, he took time to reply. Of course, the mind can rationalize fighting back, he said, but the heart, the heart would never understand. Then you would be divided in yourself, the heart and the mind, and the war would be inside you. I wish I could believe in this duality of mind and heart. I dare say that the mental conflict I have experienced comes from the absorption of certain religious values from an early age, and I'm certainly not conscious of having been reared to hate but hurt others. And so I remain conflicted. This was not the life I might have hoped for, but I have had the privilege to share a gift not everyone can claim of their lives. I was involved in a collective struggle, a revolutionary moment, the fight for political and economic justice. I saw what can be achieved when people stick together. That's precious. I'm not a pacifist. Reluctantly and regrettably, that is where I am. What parent wouldn't protect their child from violence? My core conflict is that I stand over my actions and yet profoundly regret the hurt inflicted. It is an uncomfortable and often a difficult lived experience to attempt to justify. But I believe our struggle was necessary and therefore justified. War came to us. People were hurt. I hurt people. Enemies, yes, but even their loss and pain is a matter of regret. Very good. Well, um, I'm not done yet. Um, um, I mean, uh, pacifism, I, I, Nelson Mandela found a quote of Gandhi's that violence is preferable to degradation. Um, do you think that the society, you know, in general, seeing the, the IRA's campaign as valid is an important part of the peace process? And is it achievable, which of course are not necessarily the same thing? Well, we talked about the uh, legacy of the conflict. The victims obviously is a big part of that legacy. But there's so much needs to be done. This battle of narratives that we are engaged in and have always been engaged in, getting our truth out there and what the British state was doing to us. So that will continue. I think progress has been made with a long way still to go. I think it's encouraging that more of us are, are now telling our stories. Uh, I, I see Gaz McCann in the audience in this wonderful book. Republicans are now telling their, their stories. And these are important stories. I hope uh, my book is a contribution to that. You were involved a kind of in a microcosmic. Oh, sorry, Josh. Josh <laughs> you were involved in a kind of almost microcosmic truth and reconciliation process with Joe Barry. Did you? Did you learn something from that that can be applied to the general process? I mean, you mentioned, of course, dialogue, and you know, can that's, you just say a little bit more about that? That's it. That is possible. You know, if, if, if you think of all the reasons why she shouldn't meet me, you mm -hmm. know, and yet she continues to. So it's just showing you what's possible, and if you can replicate in that some way, facilitate others to do similar. I mean, that, that, in a way, isn't that dealing with that legacy? Mm -hmm. That's one approach. And I mean, is there a lesson to be learned from political leadership? Uh, to help it, facilitate it, you know, uh, resource it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And as you went around the, the world, 
uh, I mean, there have been many, many countries discussing this issue. Do you have a sense that uh, there are people that perceive the conflict in Ireland as a colonial war? Very, very audiences, you only really get a, um, a real sense of an audience is when they, be, they get to the stage when they're asking the questions. But you invariably find you know, a very uneven and mixed response, but there will always be somebody who does get it, who, who does appreciate you know, the, the, the colonial nature of the struggle we're involved in, you know, the anti-colonial nature of it. Mm -hmm. And you know, that's always encouraging when you meet that. Right. Okay. Well, We'd open it up now to everybody else if anyone wants to. Yeah, I think we're maybe to use if anyone is the live in person audience that has a question, I do have one or two chapters to it before as well. So is there anyone in the audience here who wants to want to come in the stage or not? Paul? You, yeah. Uh, you talk about the right? And the power you know, not really funny because he moved things back. When I read the intro, I got a sense that it was one of those difficult things. And for to talk about you were addressing a bigger audience in your book. Yes. Did you have a sense when you read the book? Did you say you were addressing a bigger audience at that point? Um, that's, that's two different questions, there, really, isn't it? Two, two interesting points. Um, as I did mention that sometimes we found it impossible to continue. Uh, the circumstances that we were, we were, it was actually at Warrington, and there was a group over from Israel Palestine there, and uh, uh, the, the usual um, mix of, of, of English victims of IRA operations that would attend Warrington. And um, so it's a, it's a big, ch a charged room. There's a lot of pain in that room, you know. And there was a lot of the questions were very political um, and taken a uh, like a firm anti-Republican line. Sometimes, and that was one of them, I fall back and become defensive, and, and I give a like a you know lot of I, I defend the armed struggle without fully grasping the pain that can be causing. I, th I think when you go into a setting like that, you have to have it sorted out in your own head, you know, head what it is that needs to be said and how to say it properly, you know, and have let it let myself down on occasions through anger, through anger, through defend, defending the armed struggle. And I, I, again, on this particular occasion, Joe, Joe couldn't continue the meeting, you know, and uh, that led to us um, not meeting, I think, for some three months. I'm not too sure now. There was a second part there, wasn't there, Paul? It, the, the audience has changed um, through it. I, I did start off hoping to um, write about the meetings with Joe. I thought, well, you know, up a meeting, all these meetings, we're next. We, we'd uh, worked on a documentary together, but how can I really start to talk about you know, some of the insights that uh, we've garnered from the experience of meeting. Natural progression would have been to jointly uh, write a book and that was our initial intention. That morphed during the years for various reasons into this one. Uh, it, uh, uh, the, the first book, uh, this is the first book I wrote, uh, Gangsters or Gorillas, which looked at the misrepresentation of the Republican movement in fiction. But I recognize that that misrepresentation goes in all facets of life. And I, I began to see that in some regard, what I was doing with the work with Joe and with other victims was also uh, involved in the same. It, because even in responding to questions, you're having to think deeply about that conflict and, and answer for it, you know, uh, explain it. That in itself is dealing with the misrepresentation, no better way than to present yourself and you know, have that dialogue. So as, uh, the point is the, um, the intention behind the, the writing and the perceived readership altered in the course of writing it. There's a question from uh, the people listening to the stream from somebody called Jack. Has there been any acknowledgement or acceptance of the efforts by yourself 
and Joe Barry by political parties and British Army veterans groups to generate understanding, if not re reconciliation? Well, I've already mentioned the fact that uh, I've met uh, veterans, various veterans, even though there, there would have been ones who would have um, um, re rejected you know, the, the, the time in the Army and what the Army was doing, the British Army. Um, I've also met other uh, 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 British Army squaddies who would have been uh, you know, hurt in bombs, etc., and who uh, would not see it like the veterans. I've met quite a cross section, you know, and uh, I think it's very difficult for squaddies coming through that experience to see it from our perspective. You see it in some of the comments that are made, you know, in recent years, you know, uh, the whole soldier F thing and, you know, bloody Sunday. Very difficult for them. And, I, I, you can talk about indoctrination, and I think there was indoctrination. One of the lessons I learned was from one of the vets. He talks about how coming out of the conflict, he really nearly had to undo the training in his mind. Mm -hmm. now, the mind had, had so constrained his thinking, you know, and that coming out of that conflict, just uh, getting back to what it was, his normal feelings, reactions, you know, to violence, et cetera, was part of a healing. Uh, that healing was undoing the, uh, the training, mm. you know, the training to kill. Mm. Mm -hmm. And the actions he, he would have carried out. Right. There's another dimension to that, you know, uh, the, the healing. Yes. Yourself? Hi, uh, 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 as a former woman of yours, Early seventies, I started in my early nineteen seventies. And as a young uh, seaman in my school, uh, I, I was sort of looking when I read your book. I saw a similar uh, experience in a sense. I think you described it again on the construction. You know, people weren't conscripted into the army. They went out to the power. And I ended up at the end of the Navy for 12 years as a 15 year old. And one of the things that's talking about your, your book, which I think is, is uh, very, very true to the markets there. And some here in Poland, they say we get the shade makes us in the markets, so the market. Mm -hmm. But, um, <laughs> short drama. But the, the thing that struck me was that at that time we were actually opponents. I was carrying a gun in the Royal Navy, and whatever you were doing was whatever you were doing. But uh, the, the, the journey that I read from your book had, was uh, Republicans aren't born, they, they're made by experience. You know? I'm looking at family there, so you know, kind of fantastic table, fantastic way. And what struck me was my journey when I came out of the Navy. Mm -hmm. Coming back in Belfast, you were treated as an outcast. Mm -hmm. And I think that comes through in your book as well about living in Norwich you know? mm -hmm. uh, and, and being treated like, and, and yet you felt so safe in the market. Mm -hmm. And whenever I left the Navy, you know, and I ended up going in the public movement in the 70s, but one thing struck me was the, the, the common journey if you know, of people, and, and, you, and you, you describe. The Republican movement as a family. And that's what I mean. For me, you initially was seen as an insider. You know, after the establishment, he's a spy, he's this, he's that, you know. Uh, and, and I carried a gun. But I didn't carry a gun to anyone except the Majesty of the Queen. They gave me a gun. <laughs> so, in that respect, and with the Veterans for Peace organization of the the former soldiers and, and sailors and, and airmen. I think it's a, it's it's something you, you, you touched on earlier with that there needs to be more of that because it's it's the grunts who did the business. Yeah, I completely agree. You know, you know you you I know that uh, there's, there's a clamor for you know to get squatties to uh, you know face their actions, what they the did when they're in uniform and we know that, and that's important. Because people want to know the truth. 
But the people we really want to see in the dock is the, the generals, the military brains, and the politicians who sent them there, and the people who financed them. That's who we want to see in the dock. Yeah. Tommy? I, I, I honestly felt very uh, close to a lot of the veterans, veterans I met. You know, once you, once you do you sit down and you talk to these guys. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> You're stretching it. <laughs> but uh, no, I felt very close to them. You realize there was a commonality of experience, you know. And let's face it, I mean, probably there'd be very few people in this room who don't have a history in their family of people who served in the Crown, you know. You know, if you skip generations, I had a, a grandfathers in the British Army, uh, all sorts of great uncles killed in the Western Front, etc. That's a common story amongst us all, you know. It's something that should be uniting us, unifying force. Only the people you met, and I would agree with you in the book, I met some of the veterans as well. Yeah. Um, yeah. And they were very, very to yeah. recognize the hurt that they have caused. Yeah. And I know the politics of the But at least they were prepared to accept the hurt they had inflicted. Um, kind of had met. Numerous families, different politicians over the years, and there's been very, very little recognition of that on most things. Um, and you know, you're dealing with your conference with all the people you met. I didn't get a sense yeah. that that was something of recognition. Oh, no, no. It, uh, uh, um... Well, there isn't. It's an uphill struggle, and there's so much more to do because it's, it's individuals doing it, or small groups and our small movements doing it. They've got all the resources to, uh, to hide the facts of the past. You know, that, that's it. They've got all the resources, you know, to cover their tracks. If you're adept at it, you've done it everywhere. You know, this is what we're dealing with. And I think, you know, we know that, don't we? It's not going to be easy dragging the truth out of them. Yeah. But, you know, you've got to make a start. And I always felt, as again, I go back to it, just the contact and the dialogue, crucial. And what needs to be, uh, you know, pursued, resourced, you know, encouraged. Mm -hmm. Andrew asks, you described your earlier self as a pacifist. Uh, how did you find the transition from that to, to armed struggle? Well, again, it goes back to that definition. It would have been more on the uh, the, uh, the the end of the scale that, that's anti-war, you know, because you know when you're you have to defend yourself, you know, you you know you learn you're not a pacifist, mm. yeah, you know, and the other end of the scale, you know, uh, um, I, I'm not, it's 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 difficult. Uh, I, I, I hope. Uh, what, what I've been demonstrating is that, you, you know, going to war is not easy and this goes against the grain of your being, you know, and that's part of the recovery. And uh, when you're in the struggle, you're just in it and you're dealing with it and, you, you know, you're, you try to get better at it to deal with it, to be perfectly honest, you know. Uh, but then, you know, there's a legacy there you have to deal with as well, mm -hmm. you know. Legacy in terms of the damage done, but also the damage that's been done to you. Mm. Mm. Paul uh, asked you earlier about audiences, and I'm sitting thinking that there are a lot of people in the room who made the same sorts of choices you did, and so that book speaks to them in a certain way. I didn't make the choices you did. Mm -hmm. And that book speaks to me, I find it too. I just like to say that it works for, for a different audience. But there's one question that strikes me. Um, you're clear about how far Joe had to go to get to you as it were. Yeah. And, and, and I don't get that. I mean, I really don't. If it happened to me, I can't no. imagine me doing no. what she no. does. So that, that's a profound thought for me. But what, it's not a trick question, but did you have to go as far to meet her? You know what I, mean? I go back. Well, thank you and appreciate your remarks, Bill. Um, I, I go back to that first meeting and the threshold of going through and meeting this woman. And uh, 
if I was in the same situation and I was about to meet somebody who'd hurt me or hurt somebody belonging to me, kill somebody belonging to me, kill my father, how might I react regardless of what the lead up to that encounter would be? I don't, you know, that you'd demonstrate a willingness to understand the, con the context. How would you respond in the moment? And I can't answer that. I can't. I think it's a near a miracle that you have somebody like Joe Barry is prepared to meet me, you know. But let me say this, it's, it's unusual, but it's not unique. There's this amazing um, um, organization called, uh, you know, the Peace Project, Forgiveness, the Forgiveness Project in England. It's, it's the work of a, an English journalist who collates the stories of people who have tackled the subject of forgiveness, wanted to forgive, wanting to meet somebody who's uh, hurt them at a personal level. She collates these stories. They come from all theaters of war, all, you know, a lot of stories about crime as well. What's common about them is that, that, that every conflict situation produces people who want to know that and make that contact. So it's not unique, it isn't unique, but it's difficult. You know, back to the point, that's why it needs, you know, careful nourish, nurturing and facilitation. Danny. I think there's a big problem with legacy here. And um, there's people who want revenge, there's people who want justice, and there's an overlap in that. The British government is determined for its own selfish interest to introduce uh, an amnesty, which is going to deprive travelers of access to the truth of what happened. I, mean, I cannot think of a conflict in the world. In history, where all the victims of the conflict got justice in the end. Mm -hmm. uh, so, I just want to get your thoughts on this where we, where we sit at the past and um, how we get our way in a risk. Maybe there is no way mm -hmm. to Maybe we just want to make whatever way it's hard for the cards we're going to have to accept as the past. Mm -hmm. People were hurt by that past as individuals are not just going to stand back and let it lay down. Some will, but many won't. Our communities won't either, I don't believe, you know. Um, we're not going to get justice from people in power, you know, not going to. They'll, they'll, they'll want to do what they did here in other places. I mean, that's the nature of it. Uh, we have to sort it out ourselves, I think. Uh, that is, um, look after our own. Look, you know, the, the pain amongst us, we have to look after, deal with that legacy ourselves, because we're not going to get it from our enemies. I mean, that's the way I look at it. Um, seemed a bit cynical, um, but I can't see any other recourse. I think we have to do more to deal with uh, the pain in our midst. I know it doesn't mean to say you don't attempt all the rapprochement with the, the past, the reaching out and trying to understand and coming together to explain each other's context, all oh, that's necessary too, but I don't believe the real powers of the will ever own up to its culpability. We're going to have to deal with it ourselves. Thank you. I'm sort of fine on the and something you said there, you're not going to get justice. No. What's your view then on the honesty? Um, if, and, and honesty doesn't preclude the truth coming out for a start. And it is about the truth. We want to know the truth. I, I see when you're in jail and you know the, the peace process when it's early, early days, we were actually concerned that amnesty would be dangled there to win concessions. You know, uh, we didn't we didn't want to be a concession. We know what we went through, you know. I, I don't need them to tell me that I that I, you know, I was a, a, a POW or that I was involved in a legitimate struggle, you know. And they'll never concede that point. I don't, I don't think so. Why would they concede that point and go and do what they did here elsewhere? Yeah. So uh, I think it starts with us here. You know.
the and the age of the first, and then she's not the young. And so the number of the average countries, the number didn't come in the unit. The total number of common lives, the total number of children killed, Margaret killed, is 22 years of age. And yet her papers are still sequestered by the British government a hundred years plus yeah. now. Yeah. And you wonder why uh, if it was a hundred years ago. And if uh, anybody involved in that back in time, we had to go home. We shot at our own door. And it was a, a monument to our ancestors back in the old Circle Road in the near uh, the East Wall of Dublin. And, but yet the inquest, the very death, is still sequestered yeah. by the British government and the, and the war department. So I don't think we have much of a chance. Honest, given the hundred years from moment where anybody else was born, they still hold on to the secrets of that young woman. That was the early age. was a brilliant person. We thought an advanced our country in 1921. And she was, her leg was killed 12 hours into the first. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Roy. I was. I'm fascinated by the fact that you have these long meetings with the journalists and they go on and on and on. Because most people, some cry for revenge, some cry for justice, mm -hmm. lots of them use this word closure. Yeah, yeah. As if there is a finality yeah, for yeah. closure. But what I thought was so fascinating about your relationship with her is that closure is endless. It, it, it is a process. It is not. No, it's closure. You know, it's it's a circle that can't be squared, isn't it? It goes back to that imagery again. I don't think you, some people maybe can, I don't know, or find it easier to deal with, with the past. But uh, once they've uh, entered into that sort of uh, uh, communion, dialogue, whatever, I, and you can't be prescriptive. You know, you can't say to people, this is the, this is, this will, is the way out of your, your trauma. You can't say that. All you can do is offer it as an example. I hope that somebody will take it up on that. But uh, I mean, I mean, it's not as if I have answers here. You know, <laughs> I don't come here with answers. She's never done that. She's never done that. But yes, I'm sure she does. But she's never expressed it. You know, uh, never tried to change my. I think I think she's shown um, a lot of insight in the historical reasons for the struggle. She does appreciate, as I said, she's been coming over to Ireland uh, very shortly after the bomb. I think she just talked about being here in 86, which is remarkable when you think about it. Yeah. So could that, could your relationship with her, could that be a template for reconciliation? It's an example, it's not a template, um, because I think we're all individuals and others will do it in their own way. You know, if they ever allowed it, and that's what they want. Again, I go back, I can't be prescriptive. All you can hope that it might encourage, but somebody will see some value in the, in the dialogue. It might encourage others to be opened up similarly or to the extent that they feel able to. Yeah. Sorry, just a, uh, thank you very much. I want to make a comment, really. Um, I, think it's a, I think it's fantastic, but I think it's a uh, monumental achievement. I think it's uh, really important, but at this stage of, of, of our, our struggle, which is going to come along. You mentioned about Holyrood, we mentioned a lot about Holyrood at the time, but we certainly have a very strong political party and the Republican Party. I think the Republican movement party is going to be stronger because that group is in place. I think it's essential, but uh, it's over that courage again, which is something, of course, you have experience. Um, but the, what I want to say as well is, hope you, hope you keep writing because uh, I don't worry about like green books and uh, you're know, <laughs> a different phrase, but I do hope you keep writing because you're a writer as well. And, uh, I would dispute that, I have to say. I don't feel a writer if I had a struggle getting it out. But I'd say there's, there's writers in this room. I'm looking around this and knowing some of the experience in this room. I don't want to be giving anything away here. There's guys, <laughs> there's guys and women in this room could tell stories, you know. <laughs> Jazz. My experience of those of us in this room as well, 
quite a few years. Um, what we have in the block that you were describing, obviously, in cages with comradeship, yeah, that collective that you spoke about, and that's what always got us through. And it was also within that, it was individuals as well who would have inspired you as well. Yeah. When the most difficult of times, you would have stood up, or even if you were down, it's all the time pulling up. And you wouldn't have had that. I also found that my most difficult period in jail was when I was in solitary. Thankfully, I didn't face that too long. And probably the longest was about two weeks. Mm -hmm. It was really, really difficult. And that always made me think about the reason I did. But it was a voice from that and how they got through their time without comradeship, without people to take care of and possibly even without a heavy voice. I always wanted how to get through that. You get used to sort of things. You would be adapted, so it means it's difficult to start again after a while. You find a level, you get used to it. How did you get through it? And we always used to talk about that, you know, how did the lads over there, how they endure that with their comradeship. And we also say this sort of thing, because we're not good. Yeah, no, no. <laughs> well, I, I, I said, I think Chris never went through that hitch block experience. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Look, we had comradeship because we were, we were in, um, most of my time in England would have been in uh, special security units, so it was only seven prisoners. Typically, though, three of those would be IRA guys, you know, and, uh, and, the, and the, one of my comrades here uh, was in Durham, and she, she had a, a comrade there with her. But they, they had that. I would say that when we went into the British prison system, which was in uh, 85, 86, most of the real hard battles with the authorities and with uh, the other prisoners had been won. We'd come through and gained a measure of, you know, you know we weren't under attack. This is Republican prisoners and those who would have been there uh, facing Republican charges that weren't actually Republicans. Uh, so it went through horrendous ordeals. But because of their struggles, we in a sense benefited from it. All we had to do was ensure that uh, what was gained was kept, you know, and uh, but I, I felt very fortunate in being in circumstances, was always at least a couple of comrades around. It's very important, you know. But you also have to, um, you know, come to realize your own strengths and weaknesses and, you know, <coughs> look with your own resources, you know, there's times you just have to you have to do it on your own. Yeah. I guess so. Is any anybody else have any final question? No. Okay. So then, Tim, uh, I'm just going to you so to the Zoom. Um, so yeah, thank you very much for every to everyone and um, for asking questions for participating those who are on the Zoom. Um, thank you very much in particular to both Tim and to Pat, um, as a few people mentioned in the audience um this book is crucial um for all of us for sure reason and, and also the timing of it um it starts conversations like there were in this room tonight and uh, as pat was saying you know dialogue and conversation is going to be um one of the main elements as, as we move forward and whatever way it's like so that's not so we have to keep talking um, to each other to everyone um and um i know pat's pat book is, is, is a great start um, for that. So, can I ask for a new turn of your thoughts and some of the